Is this thing working? Oh, it is. What do, you, what do we say we get this thing started here? Um, first of all, thank you guys for coming. And I guess I don't know whether this, the virtual thing is going, but I also want to welcome the virtual audience. And I know this will be recorded, so folks can also view it at their leisure some other time. Um, so as always, I have to get up and make a few quick announcements. Uh, uh, what we always like to do is start off with some of our sponsors. And we can't do this festival without um, great partners, great sponsors, just to name a few that have been really wonderful this year. Uh, the Mary Duke Bill Foundation has been great supporting us. Uh, we work with Castle House, uh, 21 C Museum Hotel, uh, Horse and Buggy Press, uh, numbers of others. But they're all credited on our programs and websites, and they're invaluable. We can't, we can't do it without them. Um, I also like to let everybody know about uh, some of the upcoming events. We have lots of stuff for the rest of the month, but the things that are upcoming uh, the soonest is uh, we start a series of uh, talks uh, by women creators at the 21C Museum Hotel. Um, this Wednesday, though this Thursday is the first of those, it's with Rhonda Klavansky. Uh, later in the month, Tamika Galanis, and then at the end of the month, Margaret Sarter will be talking there. Um, then, of course, there's the third Friday openings. There's several throughout Durham that I recommend. Uh, in particular, at Durham Arts Council, we have two exhibitions uh, by a previous PIC grant winner and this year's. One is the Six Feet Project. It has a beautiful exhibition. Uh, and also our, our winner this year from the Southern Equity Studios, Liz Williams, is going to do a pop-up show of her work. Uh, there's a great show called From Fallujah at PS 118 and multiple exhibitions uh, throughout Durham. Um, then on Sunday, we're doing our very first ever uh, photo fair at the uh, Durham Central Park Pavilion uh, from 10 to two on Sunday. Lots of really cool activities, great artists there. And then later in that day is our second keynote, which is Alex Harris, and that's at the Durham Arts Council Theater. Um, so get, a, get one of our schedules, check our website, tons more stuff going on. So just be aware of all that kind of stuff. Um, I also have to say just a special thanks to NCMA this year. Our partnership with them this year has just been the best it's ever been. Uh, we've had such great support uh, from Linda Doherty. Uh, Jen Dassel was one of the jurors for our Persever exhibition, which is out on the fence. You've been watching a slideshow. This slideshow represents all the artists, not all their work, but all the artists that submitted to the fence. And then there's the ones that got selected beyond the fence. It was a great response. I wish everybody could have had their work in, but if you haven't had a chance, walk up near the upper parking lot and all along that fence line is an exhibition of 77 photographs. Um, so Jen was one of the, uh, the jurors for that event. Um, we also worked with Ollie Wagner, who helped with the education programs. They've done workshops here this month. Um, uh, Rachel Woods is the head of the park grounds and she helped us and this wonderful uh, guy at eBay helped clear out that whole fence line. So it's really beautiful and, and ready for the art and ready for you guys to see. And most of all, I wanna thank Angela Lombardi. She's just worked with us and made everything here great, smooth, promoted. We're so glad to work with them. And I'm gonna turn it over to her to introduce our good buddy, Titus. Thank you so much, Bryce. It's been really wonderful working with you. We're excited to see the artwork out on the fence. We're excited to see people interacting with it as we drive by and walk in the park. So it's been a wonderful experience all the way around for us as well. So I would like to introduce our keynote speaker today, um, Titus Brooks Higgins. And what I'm gonna do is read his statement because it's so beautifully put and there's no way that I could encapsulate all of his um, accomplishments better than this, and so bear with me. I'm really excited to introduce him. So the social uses of photography, especially portrait photography, have become commonplace, making it easy to miss the powerful significance that can be achieved by photographing people who are typically left out of the story. The work of Titus Brooks Higgins continues to profess the importance of the portrait, not as simply a product of brief encounters between himself, his cameras, and various sitters, but as instances of truth. They're visual samples of representation that, li that lives live, lived that are often intentionally hidden within social, economic, and judicial structures. 
Bringing these stories of representation into public spaces is a key artistic motivator and will be one of the topics of discussion in the artist talk today. Titus Brooke Higgins is a documentary portraitist. His work records the experiences of those who descended from Africa through the lens of social justice and those who have been othered in the United States and abroad. Higgins' work has taken him across the nation and the globe, seeking threads that bind members of the African diaspora. His major bodies of work illuminate the spiritual expressions of Black Americans, Afro-Cubans, Haitians, Afro-Brazilians, among others. He has captured the lives of descendants of Black servicemen in Vietnam, the displaced in China, and those whose gender expression has been a source of joy and oppression in the US and abroad. Most recently, Higgins has turned his lens to the contemporary protests by African Americans and allies for social justice against, brought against to public attention by the confluence of the COVID-19 pandemic and the murders of African American men and women. Higgins was born in Chicago, Illinois, and her holds an AB in political science from Duke University and an MFA in photography from the University of Michigan. He has taught graduate courses on image theory, women's history of photography, and history of photography. His work is in the collection of the Smithsonian Institute, the North Carolina Museum of Art, the Do Good Fund, the Halsey Institute at the College of Charleston, and Casa de Africa in Havana, Cuba. He has exhibited across the country and in Paris, France, as well as Cuba. Higgins also lends his time to mentoring beginning photographers. So please join me in welcoming Titus to the stage. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I would like to first to thank uh, the Click Photography Festival for giving me this opportunity to come and speak about my work. Also, I would like to certainly thank the North Carolina Museum of Art, not only for the opportunity to speak, but also for the other visual opportunities that they have given me throughout many years since they initially collected the uh, first portfolio of, of my work somewhere back in, I believe, maybe 2008 or 2009, or, or maybe one or one or two years bef before that. Can photography be redemptive? Can any photographic practice save me? or you from the sins that we place upon others so undeservingly. I was born on the west side of Chicago, but raised in a small African-American community in Houston, Texas, six blocks by six blocks. That tiny space of racial and economic confinement held my world, shaped my views of who I was, made me clamor for the life and freedoms I have reached for throughout the, these many years that I have lived. You see, I left the prayer, as we called it short for prairie, those blocks where we black children lived. This place never left me in my intercourse with the outside world. As a result, whenever I see young black men, young black boys especially, walking shirtless down any street, my mind and visions are drawn back to the prayer, remembering hot and humid summer days, walking streets covered with broken shells and the white dust rising from every footstep covering our black skin. A Shirley card would never have given the right exposure. I am a portraitist. I spent the entire month of February too far, excuse me. Obviously, I am not technologically adept. <laughs> I apologize for that. <laughs> I spent the entire month of February 2020 in Cuba, photographing in the transgender community. Issues of representation remain unresolved 
in this so-called modern world. And photography in this instance creates a history that never can be erased. Portrait photography has been the main vehicle for documenting the lives of trans persons. There we go. All right, maybe I've got the hang of it now. In capturing these images, I rely on classical post postures, expressive faces, and personal interiors that express moments of vulnerability. In particular, I love photographing in Cuba. I love the palette uh, as the bodies work, work against that. The body of work presently titled, I Still Love You, and in its entirety presents not only reflections of trans vavacy, but also expressions of intimacy and sensuality layered with identity. This is a heartfelt project for me for the past five to six years. The world closed when I returned home. For me, the future remains uncertain as I self sequester. Understanding the importance of safety and survival, I knew people who were failed by the virus. Death seems to have stalked both my family and friends during this period of international calamity. Additionally, being African American, I have a health condition that gives me pause. I ventured outside, though, in spite of these warnings, to capture the Black Lives Moment movement, Black Lives Movement moment. Understanding this was the fire next time, so eloquently written about by James Baldwin. I was not shy to lend my camera to an organization so erroneously labeled Marxist by antagonists who attempted to fracture the movement. Those adversaries loudly proclaimed that the movement brought dangerous protests to an otherwise peaceful nation. But I saw clearly through these admonishments, understanding lessons from the many years of life that I have brought, that have brought me to the conclusion that it is blackness that is at the core of America's fear. Black neighborhoods, black music, black bodies, all bring to mind negative context, context where I live. That's why I print to the darkness when printing my photographic art. I remember while in graduate school pursuing an MFA, I was constantly asked by my professors why my printers, why my sitters were printed so darkly. I would respond, well, they are black people. And I think that's beautiful. Emphatically, I was saying with the rendering of dark skin that it was far beyond the time to stop being afraid of dark skin. My cameras were also drawn to the struggle over the Confederate Civil War monuments. As I remembered, I guess this happened. Sorry, I apologize again. Um, my cameras were also drawn to the struggle over the Confederate Civil War monuments. As I remembered the many drives between Durham and Washington, DC, when my wife Maureen and I stopped in Richmond for a quick dinner before entering the food wasteland as Highway 85 headed south to our home. There we were forced to pay homage to both Lee and Davis as we drive along Monument Avenue. These statutes began overtaking the Southern landscapes at the turn of the 20th century. About the same time, the narrative of the war began to change in the South. The idea of the lost cause, a noble rebellion, similar to what we are suffering today. In the past, my photographic intent has been accused of having a subjective intent. There we go. All right. Maybe I figured this out now. <laughs> I am convinced that my critics feel that my blackness influences my interpretation, style, and composition as I create images. So as I witnessed the Trump-inspired Open Up North Carolina protests, I decided I want to take a different visual approach to the task. There were harsh moral choices presented as answers to closing down the country because of COVID deaths. 
policies that promoted saving lives balanced against the harmful effect of the lockdown. Anti-lockdown protesters made libertarian arguments waving don't tread on me flags. There were visual implications that we should do a benefits cost analysis whereas we determined just how many people we were willing to sacrifice in order to get the, and keep the country going. But we knew the burden of the sacrifice would be unevenly laid upon the lives of minorities that were a smaller percentage of the population, but a considerably larger pro proportion of essential service workers. I wanted to make images from a spectator's position, but also include an artistic intention, thereby capturing portraits that the subjects were approached and were given the choice of what they wanted to convey to an audience. I wanted to intentionally not show images of insurrection, but I certainly wanted to capture images of quiet anger, making the audience collaborators with me and the sitters in matters of race. I admit that the use of angling my character was to give my camera was to give the viewer an illusion of a personal experience. But admittedly, I feel I failed as I decided that I wanted dark tones to be included in this work as the death toll of, the, of COVID grew and friends and family were failed by the pandemic. I just couldn't be impartial as daily death tolls were broadcast. And so many people wanted our country to proceed as if we lived in a place of normalcy. Quickly, I learned how unsafe that was and retreated back into my semi-solitude with my wife, Maureen, who is at that time and still currently working from home. As my cameras gather dust and continue to do so, my heart suffers, mood swings, and my writing provides the only creative solace. My life has taught me that there are impermeable differences in this America and the world created by Western ideology. I have concluded that there is a certain disposability of black bodies in this country. Each time I see and photograph a young black man, I am reminded of Charles Alford, Alford's beautiful, beautiful body. We affectionately called him Bo, and he always walked proudly and shirtless in all of his beautiful blackness throughout our neighborhood. He was and continues to be my black Adonis. But alas, my photographic over has added an image reminiscent of my youthful days of shirtless boys. In creating the image Devante, I was well aware of the racial bias that is built into photography. Photography is not simply a system of calibrating light to form a latent image in the negative, whether celluloid or digital. It is a technology of subjective and objective decisions. As I waited to capture the image, I thought of all the issues in black representation, black identity and black culture that I would scratch upon. I thought of how it would all be misunderstood, but some would actually get it. Most of all, the image Devante would mark the beginning of my creating a plurality of images of black boys and men that would focus on the injustices that were a part of my community. In Devante, being placed in this green space, what's most prominent besides this little shirtless five-year-old is all of the ivy. And in art, ivy denotes fidelity. Devante stands in this field of ivy, waiting for his unseen, waiting on his, with his unseen mother for a bus to carry them home. Many nights I've wondered at what, why my first eye, then my camera were drawn to him and the scene. Since capturing the image, I've come to understand and can, that I was and continue to be Devante. As a child and young adult, and even as a grown man, 
I was connected to my mother. But there's more to that story. Devante and his mother were in dire straits when I approached them that day. She was jobless and seeking employment. Imagine a young black woman seeking employment with a young black male toddler in tow. What are the actual possibilities of her finding a job? They were being evicted from their shared home the next morning. The scene and the conversations afterwards that day with his mother reminded me of the financial issues I suffered because for one thing, there was a law and policy in Texas where my mother was a teacher that mandated, that mandated that she be paid less than her white counterparts. Now, the Texaco station did not give us a reduced price on gas, nor did the grocery store where we shop for food, nor the clothing stores. I, to this day, remember my parents scraping enough money to pay the poll tax so they could vote in this so-called free democracy. As today, so many state legislatures move to limit voting of African Americans as they were in legislatures in the 40s and 50s in America. I knew Devante would be viewed as older by whites and less innocent than white boys his age and would be less protected in every arena in America. As I continued to question myself as to why I stopped that day and waited almost 20 minutes to take the photo, what repeatedly comes, what repeatedly comes to me was the child's expression of vulnerability. He was black, small, and defenseless. Shirtless, implying open and exposure to the elements a racialized life from which there was, there was and is no escape. What is glorious, beautiful, and sometimes at the same instant also is tragic. Most of all, photography can show us what is most human about our existence. I met Six O and his family almost six years ago. I began photographing them almost immediately. Six O and his sons took me again back to my old stops. They were resilient, beautiful, and aware of who they were and stood proudly each time I encountered them, whether with or without a camera. Their home was small, but filled with concern and love for each other. The home was also intergenerational, as three generations vied for attention in their daily lives. The first encounter was as I drove by and saw the patriarch building a small motor scooter for his granddaughter. He said to me, she'll grow into it. He was planning for her future. I knew I liked him as he smiled when he looked me straight in the eye. The photographic image, whether still or moving, informs us of how we should act. There is a common narrative, both written and visual, about the Black image in photography. Cultural commentators on the latent image rarely admit that the negative that they initiate through intellectual discourse on images of Black Americans is rarely neutral and mostly loaded with stereotypes and negative perspectives. The continuation of the white gaze as the result of photographic white gaze has shaped our common collective histories and leading to implicit bias, which people of color continue to, ex to uh, experience. Next, there we go. So from an incident at a university where campus at, uh, police attempted to leak an undergraduate student with the disappearance of a laptop, I created this body of work titled Hooded Up. Essentially what happened was a student was walking through one of the graduate schools and apparently some hours earlier, a laptop had, had disappeared. 
this undergraduate student was wearing a hoodie and had the hoodie pulled over his head. A telephone call was made to one of the administrators in the graduate school when the police officer said, one of your students stole a laptop. Now there was no record of this, but simply because that person was there wearing a hoodie, he was automatically guilty. The administrator replied, none of my students are here because her students were only students that were at the university during the summer, and this was February. But the thing that made him guilty was the hoodie and his black skin. At the Black Portraiture Four conference at Harvard University, The Color of Silence, I spoke of these images as a factual description and a visual poetic interpretation of black lives and the pain of being cast not only as non-white, but as others. Printed size 30 inches by 40 inches, the portraits of Hoodie Up render the subjects in almost life size. Their gaze is intensified, offering contradiction to the re reconfigure traditional images of African-American youth. Hoodies are an extremely pragmatic item of clothing. They completely engulf the torso and offer protection and warmth to the head. They are secretive, offering seductiveness to the head and more importantly, giving the wearer a choice as to whom they will reveal themselves to. Hoodies are armor. They protect the wearer from the realities of their lives. There is a phrase in clothed cognition for this phenomenon. In clothed cognition captures a, the systemic, systematic influence that clothes have on the wearer's psychological process. Clothing can enhance your psychological states and it can improve our performance as well as offer security in an increasingly unsafe world. These images present, permit the sitters to express adversity, to celebrate their culture, or to engage the viewer in equal standing. They pay visual homage to black identity and should naturally be called resistance photography as they challenge paradigms, policies, and misrepresentational visual narratives about race. The practice of photography is also a means of self-reflection, poetic expression, and visual communication. Yet well into the millennial, black, red, and brown males are continually seen and photographically captured as threatening, as being enraged, and also suspect. This is the common prescriptive narratives that lead and yield to the created caricatures and visual critiques of young men of color. Historically, Polk, Van Der Zee, Parks, De Carava, and other black photographers placed a pivot to change notions of who we are and what our lives are about. We all know this, but today, where is this pivot placed? Do black photographers have the ability to intercede at this critical point? Do we have the right? Is there risk associated with presenting counter narrative images? Can portraiture become a provocateur demonstrating the range of complexities, emotions and aesthetics visually demonstrating a wider range of who we are? Culturally and socially, we should ask what truly is the nation, is the nature of personal black identity. What do we glean from this image of Robert as he stands three blocks from the home I grew up in? What is the true origin of our national, racial and cultural signifiers as they always self-define or are they subtly forced upon us, not by our peers, but by those who do not have our best interests at heart? 
how we identify ourselves may categorically, may be categorically different from how others characterize ourselves. The repercussions from these discrepancies resonate in notions of authorship throughout not only the portraits of bodies of work, such as hooded up, hooded up but in everyday simple acts of photographing blackness. The question presented is what parts do artists play in the continuation of stereotypes of people of color? When authorship is shared in the creation of portraits, the resulting image produces an equal status interaction between minority sitter and majority viewer. The visual narratives of work such as Hooded Up present a counterpoint to stereotypes as they show vulnerability and facial expression as well as body language. But they also show the complexity of anger and emotion minorities are hesitant to express before the camera. This reciprocal space of the photographic portrait, that space existing between the subject and photographer hold the reservoir of answers to the misperceptions resulting in the culmination of visual stereotypes. All right, we're there. No. I apologize. I think I must have a heavy finger on, on this. I continue to indulge myself in the practice of printing large scale portraits, landscape style of black people. I also hung these large portraits in my studio. I experienced their beauty each day as I opened my space, but I grew tired of other artists informing me that I've, if I displayed work of a different nature, more people would enter and enjoy my studio space. I'm sure that was when the label of angry black man was cemented onto my life. How do you find compassion for otherness? How do you represent otherness? How do you visually represent otherness? What are the considerations? Are they yours as the photographer, or are they the sitters, or are they both? Can it be more than the image? Can it be about more than the image created? Can the image reflect more about the relationship created as a part of the process while taking the photograph? Art, in its essence, is the transference of, a, of an emotion from one person to the other. My art is a translation of the pain, the experience of those categorized as others into a visual experience, an expression for you to see at your own peril. This photography brings systems such as ethnography, sociology, political science, history, medicine, behavioral sciences, law, and art together to allow and even, for, and even force viewers to come to an understanding and possibly a conclusion within the framework of their own life's experience. We are yet in another one of those moments as last summer's promised racial reckoning turns out to be a white lie. Black demands for full citizenship and equality are being treated as entitlement, calls for white racial accountability redefined as white persecution. And anti-racism acts continue to be falsely construed as anti-whiteness. What can I convey? What can I show you with a photograph? Photographers are the people who can build the bridges between communities that mistakenly think they are different. The role of Black photographers is crucial in creating images to bolster the demands of protesters against injustice. But it must be understood that Black photographers not only photograph demonstrations and activism, but also are representations of hope, determination, and love when the news agency photographers and network independent, independent crews have returned to their stations and newsrooms. One black independent photographer said, quote, throughout the day, 
I was photographing a more, I was photographing mourning and reflectance. Late that night, I was photographing anger, frustration, and turmoil as I witnessed the community came and embraced me because I was a black man who genuinely desired to tell their story as a whole. You see, I had skin in the game, black skin in this game, end quote. Photographic images are like languages. We may not all understand different languages, but we can all understand what a photograph tells us. The time is far too dangerous for miscommunication. The challenge is to connect people with opportunities of engagement with others. The latent image still has tremendous power to engage people meaningfully. I expect my images to have the power, whether in an exhibition of 20 or a single image to carry the hope to expand the circle of knowledge explaining the lives, tribulations, and present pathways to change. I am guided by my advocacy to delve into worlds where many would not venture. Remember, the only time we learn is when we are open and when we are able to leave our comfort zones. The fear of being in unfamiliar territory forces us to be open to things we would never consider as solutions to problems. As photographers, it is really imperative that we realize that we have a tremendous amount of power. Yes, photography can change the world when used as a tool for social good. The medium can bring awareness of inequities to, an un to, unfamiliar, to un and unfair policies, but after the creation of those images, institutions must recognize display and use their power to push forward these images that are visual diaries and have the power to influence and change opinions. Gordon Parks said he used this camera as a weapon to show stories of injustice. I think those whose work appear on the walls of such spaces such as the North Carolina Museum of Art have a particular duty. The very fact of the placement upon these walls shout that we as artists must be reckoned with by the populations, whether they ever enter these doors or not. These platforms are no more neutral than a political rally as by the simplicity of viewing impressions are made. Opinions are shaped, acts of culture are normalized. These institutions must become more equitable in their service to communities of color. How do we as artists face Americans and say we are making the best possible choices available? The past 18 months, I have been facing two movements in this country. Both movements are about survival. The survival of black men, women, and children to be safe in their homes, streets, churches, and communities. The other about heritage, personal freedom, and mass added to issues of their effect on their economy. Typically, these two movements are discussed separately and visuals of each other never group together, but each is a part of the struggles of two parts of America. When placed together, they evident a zero sum political action where one group attempts to maintain political, social, and economic power as the other group attempts to struggle to change their place and gain respect and safety in our country. Two movements, each representing moral choices, requesting governments to act for their benefit. Do we defund the police for the benefit of the black minority? Do we open up our state's economy for the benefit of the majority and the detriment of the vulnerable? This is a moment for almost every country in our world as nations face screaming protesters demanding utilitarian choices to be made by governments. 
I'm a baby boomer. And such, I've witnessed the assassinations of John Kennedy, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy, Medgar Evans, Emmett Till, and countless who go unnamed. I witnessed the Vietnam War, the resignation of Richard Nixon, three economic collapses, and the 9-11 attacks. I witnessed the civil rights movement, the volatile symbols of 1966, 67, and 68. I was there when the first man walked on the moon, watching it on channel 13, as Neil Armstrong stepped onto that alien surface. I saw the first black president elected. <clears throat> when I look back, searching to make sense out of the times, I understand and feel secure as I listen to Marvin Gaye's album, What's Going On. Listening to the songs of the Temptations taught me how to be cool and how to ask for a date. The music of Nat King Cole let me know that my spirit, which was always searching for love, was all right and applauded. Miles Davis's trumpet lured me to the wild side and unabashed otherness. Yes, emphatically yes. But when I look for images to further interrogate those times in my life, and when I see who made those images that are considered to be iconic, I see white photographers. They were there whenever and wherever I search for the visual record of those seminal events. It wasn't that we weren't there in those places, weighed down with the same Nikons, Canons, and Leicas. There were people like Teeny Harris, Keith Calhoun, Ron Freeman, Bill Gaskins, Chandra McCormick, Ernest Withers, and hundreds of others who in their black hands held the camera as an instrument against racism, inequality, and injustice. Note that I am not ignoring the work and notoriety of Eli Reed and Gordon Parks, but they are the rarity in this profession. Lastly, I would like to speak to what is an important issue to the photographic community. I have been frequently asked about photographing the Black Lives Moment movement. I have not been asked to go on assignments to document that turbulent time, but about the issue put forth by many Black photographers who ask news sources, photography agencies, and white photographers to give them first shot at photographing this critically important time. Allowing black photographers to capture these, these important images can contribute to ending the erasure, exploitation and misrepresentation of black communities. Historically, our communities have been grossly manipulated. Images depicting black men as brutes Black women as mammies or Jezebels, and normalizing stereotypical images of Blacks in subservient positions contribute to mistreatment and misunderstanding throughout the world. When Black photographers are included in visual discourse, it is an afterthought. During the protests for Michael Brown and Ferguson, photographer Robert Cohen took a photograph of activist and protester Edward Crawford throwing a tear gas canister at police. For the image, Coyne was awarded a Pulitzer, but Crawford later was found dead from a gunshot, an alleged suicide. Speaking out about injustice is like screaming into a wall, a wall that is also dangerous. Black people, especially those who are descendants of American slaves, share an understanding that throughout history and still today, that whites have always had access to our communities. While we have been denied entrance to white communities, most recently and cruelly demonstrated by the murder of Abad Aubrey for going into an unfinished and unoccupied home in a white community. This lack of access is carried over as black photographers endanger themselves as we cross the racialized geographical lines of real estate to follow visual stories. Understanding that police often mistake our cameras for weapons, access discouragements, and inhibit our abilities to perform as white photographers do in our communities without those same 
institutional and structural barriers faced by Blacks in their communities. Black photographers are, are aware that in America, white and non-Black photographers have captured images that contributed to long histories of erasure, exploitation, and misrepresentation of Black communities. Certainly, allowing only Black photographers to photograph the BLM movement won't right past or even present wrongs. We must realize that white photographers have access to media, galleries, and connections that push their images further into the public domain as they are viewed as having the most objective visual points of view. I was told by a reputable and respected photography organization that my photographic pers perspective about Black people was not credible. From my perspective, my photography is an opportunity to share our stories, our experiences from our perspectives and employ the photographic frame to rewrite an often incorrect history. My work frames my people in a manner that includes who we are with a proper understanding of our culture, expresses the beauty of our culture and blackness, and most of all, illuminates our genius to confront stereotype visual messages. As this country wrestles with the discourse born out of protest, black photographers need and demand to be included by those who hire and make assignments, not as an afterthought, but from the start, from the first moment that bears witness and capture. The eyes of black photographers give a different view and perspective. Photography through the lens of those from their communities can indeed be redemptive or perhaps minimally begin to balance the prevalence of racist photographic tropes. Images can have a transformative power that make an impact on our social, political, and economic landscape. As black photographers of parts generations use their eyes and lenses and were guided by their lives experiences as they photograph. We must do the same, following their path in the 21st century. Thank you. We'll work on that part, but now let's deal with the room. <laughs> so if there's anyone in the audience that would like to ask a question, raise your hand. Sure. How did you first come to discover how you could use an otherwise just great photograph to express message, context, story, and, and, and do you think when the audience sees your images, I um that's it's kind of a long and really deep question. Um I, I think that one of the things one of the things that convinced me about the impact that that my images, uh, but not only the, the images, but the, the way I photograph the, the way I create them and the way the way I present them. Um, I typically print really large. Uh, for me, a 20 by 30 print is a small print. Uh, my preference is to make uh, prints that are 40 by 60. I like them to be confrontational. I like my, uh, uh, my sitters to look into the camera. Uh, I think that the, when I'm photographing someone, what I constantly say to everyone, what has just become a part of my process is that I want you to, to stand, I want your facial expression to be the message that you want the viewer to, to receive. And um, frankly, that's, that, that's, that's sort of threatening. 
Um, that's particularly threatening if, if, if you're black and particularly the audience is, is, majority, is majority white. Um, my experience in, in life, so, my, so my, my father whose birthday was yesterday um, was, uh, was born in a, in a sharecropper family, uh, forced to leave school when he was in the third grade uh, because the person that owned the land said that he was big enough to work every day and he didn't need to go to school. Um, as a consequence, um, the last time my father was at my house and we had uh, 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 white guests uh, who were uh, co-workers of, of, of my wife, my, my, my father, it was difficult for him to stop saying yes ma'am no. to a young white girl who was about what, 14 and called her Miss and, uh, you know, Miss Lucy and, 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 and et cetera. And um, as a result, when I photograph, I, I try to, to look towards the strength and the beauty of, of blackness, particularly black males, and give them the opportunity through my images to, to, to show their beauty to show their manhood, to show strength. And as I was talking about the experience in, in, my, in my studio, which I closed down because I just got so tired of that. Um, you know, when people would walk in, so many people told me that I should take those images down, uh, that they were threatening, uh, that had they encountered that person on the street that they would be afraid. And I would tell them stories because everyone, I typically photograph people for a long period of time. I like to photograph you know, folks for at least two or three years. And uh, that way I get to know them, but more importantly, they get to know me. And they also, what I think give me something different than what a chance immediate and short encounter would afford us. Um, so saying that they're threatening and et cetera, it's just, it, it's, it's, a part, it's a part of my process. And it's not that I want anyone to be afraid of anyone, but it's just that I want people to, uh, to say, this is what I really think, which I think is the question that's rarely asked of people of color, or, uh, because I don't think anyone really cares what you think. Other questions? Yes, ma'am, and then we'll- I'm going to bring you the mic so the people oh. in the Zoom can hear you. Uh, hearing you talk about um, your process with um, the people you're photographing, I'm just kind of curious about that a little bit more, um, like how you kind of build rapport with them or um, the kinds of ways that you collaborate together when you're making images. Um, if you could speak about that. Curious. Sure. Um, one of the things that's, that's important to me is having some sort of, of uh, try to build a relationship with, with, with whomever I'm photographing. And I think that one of the ways uh, to easily do that is to give some part of yourself. So when I approach someone, I'm always looking at them. I look at the environment that they're in, I, everything from the way they dress, how they carry themselves. Uh, and, and I try to figure out what commonalities I have with them. And I think that that's, that may be easier for me because I grew up in a neighborhood where people really didn't have money. Uh, my neighbors, the, the mothers and fathers, the women typically did what was called day's work. So you had uh, African American women who were who were working in, in 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 white people's homes, cleaning their homes, taking care of taking care of children. Uh, the men typically were porters, uh, and, and and et cetera, jobs of jobs of that nature. But when they came into the neighborhood, into that six blocks by six blocks square, they were Mr. and Miss Greenleaf. Uh, uh, they were valued because of the way they treated their families. 
the way they treated the way they treated the kids that ran around in the neighborhood, uh, the things that they tried to to teach us, uh, to give us whatever it was, so that we would figure out sometime a way to make our lives successful, and if not successful, then happy. And I guess being happy is a success. So let's say so successful probably encompasses many things besides financial rewards, of which I'm learning because of my experiences in photography. <laughs> yes, sir. Did that answer your question sufficiently? So, so I don't, um, I, I don't do a lot of of of, uh, of setting up. I, I don't do any. Uh, I think they call it directing. I, I'm. I, I don't consider myself a director uh, of of my images. Uh, I ask the person uh, to simply stand, pose, whatever you want to say, in a way that gives the message that they want a viewer to to receive. Um, I, as I said, I try to give a, give a part of me. I try to do things to, to make, make them relax, uh, to make them feel that, that what they're saying is important. I talk about whatever body of work that they would be included in. I talk about the purpose of that work, where and how it would be shown. Uh, I speak to just anything that, 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 would, that, would be, that would be, I think, important about the work, body of work. And, and I, I, to me, I think that, that does a couple of things. One, one it says uh, that, yeah, I'm a guy with the camera and you know, having a camera is, is um, it's really, it's, it's, it's a thing about economics. I mean, cameras are expensive. It takes time to go out and photograph people. It, it takes resources to do, to do all of this. And I don't think that as photographers that we realize when we approach people who are of, of lesser means that they see us quite differently. You know, we're, we are more than likely intruders. Uh, we're interlopers into communities that, that we are only in for short periods of time. You know, it's a hit and miss, it's a boom in and, and out sort of, sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> You know, I, I've been I've been working in Cuba since 1997. I lived with the same family in Havana for 15 years. Uh, I was introduced to their friends. It got so where people in the building in the high rise that they lived in, they knew me, they knew us. They, um, you know, we could knock on doors and and, and go in, um, and and so we sort of became as much of a part of a community, I guess, as you can when you're going somewhere and say maybe spending a month, you know, each time, maybe two or three times, times a year for, for a long, long period of, period of time. You sort of become a part of the, part of the community. And I think that that changes, uh, that changes how people look at you. And it also changes, it changes your work because you see, you see everything about people. You, you begin to understand uh, their lives considerably better. And I think that those things will improve any image that you create because you're not just, just taking a photograph of someone you met, you're taking a photograph of something about someone you know. One of the, the, the other thing I think is important in my work is that I never take a picture of someone in a way that I would not want my grandmother to be photographed. <laughs> yeah, I, and, that's, and I know that sounds really silly, but but it's but I love I love my grandmother my 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 my, my maternal grandmother was just absolutely wonderful to me, and and I um, you know there's no way that I want to create an image of her that she would feel bad about, and so that's that's part of my mantra. Also, yes, sir. I have a question. Hi. I, I find your images absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Um, but I've got to put it in context as well. Uh, you say you print large. 
And I notice, especially in, in prints like this, that your prints are framed in the image. Where do you see your work being seen and shown? And since it's only large institutions that can kind of, you know, display these large images, you know, how do you think that the, the, the people that you say you want to, to illuminate can actually see them? Uh, and then, as a Black photographer, where do you get your money? You know, <laughs> where do you, you know, where do you go in order to produce well, the beautiful images? Well, let, let me let me answer the last question first. Excuse me, and I'll do this in the vernacular. I ain't got no money. <laughs> <laughs> well, I um, I have the wonderful the wonderful support of of my wife, Maureen, who, without whom this work simply could not be done. Um, it, it does, it takes a lot of money to do this. Uh, being a black photographer, I, I have rarely gotten financial support to do, any, to do any of the work that I do, unless I was doing something working for a nonprofit and you know, they were paying for something somewhere, but that's, that's a different, different situation to do anything on my personal work, uh, I've, got, I've, only, I've gotten one small grant about 10 years ago, uh, and that was less than $2,000. And that uh, afforded me to make one of my first trips to, uh, to Asia. But you know, since then, I've, I just haven't, haven't gotten any resource to do it. So I, um, several years ago, I used to dress better. And uh, I don't buy expense, a lot of expensive clothes. Uh, the other things that I used to do uh, prior to taking photography seriously have just basically dropped, dropped off my radar. Now, as far as printing large and what, and what that means, uh, there are some, some negative impacts of, about doing things in, in certain ways. But I can't let the fact that an image or whatever, some work may never end up in a museum uh, for whatever the reasons to stop me from, from creating the work. Uh, one of the things that I'm fearful about now is what will happen to all of this work that I have, that I have amassed. Um, and I'm in, I'm in some good collections, but those are typically a small, you know, small number of small number of pieces. Uh, you know, my work is not really archived, and I I do wonder about what's what's going to happen. And my biggest fear, uh, probably somebody's going to shoot me for this, but but no, my, my my honestly, my as a black photographer, my biggest fear is that I'm going to die, and that my work will be discovered 20, 30, 50 years later by a white photographer who will suddenly be thought of as a genius for finding this amazing work. And that's a, and that's a, it's a, that's, that's for real, you know, and, and um, because we, uh, you know, I don't even have anyone to leave my silverware to. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's, so that, so those, those are, those are real, real concerns, but that's not enough to keep, to stop me from, I'm doing the work. I continue to do the work because I'm driven, because my life has been filled with issues of race. My race has defined just everything about me, uh, how I lived, uh, what I have escaped, uh, what my experiences are day to day, uh, and, and, and et cetera. So my work is, is a statement against those barriers. It's a, it, it's a statement of saying that I understand that whether I graduated from you know, prestigious universities, that it, that's, that's not how I'm seen when I walk down the street. No one, no one knows that. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm seen in other ways. And my work is a contradiction. It's the way that I can fight back without going out with a Molotov cocktail.
um, the presentation that you gave and the thoughtful words that you put together deserve to be preserved and published. It was such a beautiful talk. So that's just a comment. The, Thank you. Um, the second thing, uh, you mentioned Parks' um, uh, metaphor about the camera being a gun. Uh, I hardly think you use it. I don't see you using a camera as a gun. Could you talk about how you see a camera? Do you have a metaphor for how you use the camera? Well, not, not, not an exact metaphor, but I'll tell you about this actual experience. Uh, I photograph a lot in, in East Durham. Uh, I live in East Durham. And I was actually going to photograph 6-0, uh, the guy with the two sons who was shirtless. And I was driving down uh, Holloway Street. And I drive a... Uh, drive a little blue Mini Cooper. Uh, you know, it's not an imposing kind of car. But I was driving down the street and I made a, and I looked in my mirror and there was a black and white behind me, a black and white, you know, police car. Uh, I turned my signals on because I was turning to go to six old, uh, six old's house, turned down this street. The policeman turned with me. Wasn't, I wasn't doing anything wrong. I made another turn to get to his house, and I had to make three turns before I got to his I got to his house. He wasn't there. His car wasn't there. He had told me that he may have to work late, and if his car wasn't there, it wasn't home for me to come back later on. So his car wasn't there. So I proceeded straight and got back on Holloway Street uh, on the way home, and all of a sudden, boop 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 boop, you know. So I pull over. And um, one policeman comes to the driver's window, asks me for a driver's license, registration, whatever. So I'm handing him this stuff, or at least I'm getting ready to hand, hand him this stuff. And I lean over into the glove box to get the registration. And I look and there's another policeman at the passenger window of my car. And this person has his gun drawn pointed at my head. And so I'm thinking, what did I do to merit this? And um, the entire time during this stop, you know, this gun was held, held in my head. And um, I talked to them and explained that I was a photographer. Uh, I had a camera case on the back seat. I had a camera in the front seat. And um, uh, I had a, uh, I had a, I had a small Leica. I mean, it's not that small, I mean, but they're, you know, they're about like, about like this. And uh, I explained that in the case, he asked me what was in the case. I said cameras and et cetera, because he was really curious about that. Uh, and I was really afraid that touching my camera or anything like that, that I was probably going to, going to be shot. Um, what, one of the things that, that I experienced, I leave the house going to photograph something or anything, and my wife makes me call her. And I mean, not just call her and say, I'm on my way back home. Do you need me to stop at the store for some milk? But I mean, during the process, you know, so, I, so I call home four or five times during the day where I am, just, just, just to say. So it's, it's, uh, it's you know, it's, it, it's dangerous. Um, Photographing, I was in D.C. a couple of weeks ago for the support the the people who uh, stormed the cap stormed the Capitol. Um, my wife said, "You're not going by yourself," and um, uh, I was fortunate enough to find a, a friend, another photographer, Ray Ray Pfeiffer. You know, went with me, and um, you know, so there's a. There's a, there's, 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 a, there's a lot of concern about, about there. There's, there's a lot of dangers about it. Uh, I talked to other photographers who talk about being at, uh, at protest rallies of various, on various sides and of policemen thinking that, they, that they're holding guns. And so it's a, it, it's, it's a, com it's a common fear. It's a common uh, thing that, that we're aware of. Yeah, so. Yes, ma'am. 
What's up, Titus? How you doing? Hey, Phil. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm sorry I came in late, but uh, first I wanted to say that you, you know, speaking about experiences with police, that's not a uh, one-off experience. It's something that, you know, we all do. It's, it's just very regular that we have to deal with these situations. It's just like a part of life of being Black. But um, my question for you was more so, what was the most challenging assignment you've been on? And also, what was the most challenging personal project? Oh, so the, for me, and it's um, working in Haiti is what I consider to be uh, the, the most difficult, the, 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 uh, the, the most difficult work, work that, I, that I do. And it's, it's because the country is, the country is so poor. Um, I, the first, I think probably the first year when I started working in Haiti, um, I was, uh, I, I left Port-au-Prince and went into, into the mountains and was photographing in a, in a city that was uh, called saint O, And it's a waterfall there where uh, the Virgin Mary was supposedly seen by uh, some Haitian girls. Uh, there was a, something of her, an image of her that appeared in, in, the, in this tree. And uh, it's a huge pilgrim, pilgrimage. Um, but working in Haiti is so difficult that when I'm there, and that's the one place, my wife usually travels with me to most places, uh, but that's one place that, uh, you know, I, I, she just doesn't go, I, I won't take her. Uh, the poverty is, is it's overwhelming. Uh, I first went there, I was looking for the spirit of, of uh, Toussaint Leovertour, who was one of, one of my heroes. Uh, and um, what I found was so, was so distressing that uh, while I photographed there, and I think that I, I have been able to, to get some compelling images, but it is just, it's just, it's really difficult. And it's, it's, it has quite an emotional toll uh, on, on, on me, you know, to, uh, to, just, to just work there. Hello, Mr. Titus. Love you. Hi. Glad I was ready, uh, able to reconnect with you. It's been quite quite a while. I love your work all the way back to the the uh, uh, photography of the Black Cemetery. Do you remember that? That was a few years ago. Yeah, that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, We're gonna know my age soon. <laughs> <laughs> so Gordon Parks said that he used his camera as a weapon. Could, could you unmask for just, would that be okay? He uses okay. camera as a weapon. Yeah. The young man took it a step further and said, Gun. and I think just in my interaction with, with different people, I, I understand what Gordon Parks was saying. You understand what he was saying. But to me, to say gun takes it a little, a, a little further than it needs to go. Well, you know, it, it um, I think that that um, I think there's there's a real danger um, in, in in America, uh, especially if you are if you're a, if you're a black man, um, and and I, I mean I, I don't want to keep doing this, but but there have been many times in my life where for no practical reason, I've had policemen hold guns to my head because they th thought something or whatever. And um, um, it's a part of, it's not just about power in that particular moment, but it's, it's about, a general message, you know, it, it's kind of, so after the Haitian revolution, uh, uh, um, white plantation owners and, and et cetera, uh, kill black people because they were afraid that there was going to be revolt that was going to mimic what happened in Haiti. And they cut off heads and they would call them black sign posts and they post these heads in various parts on the, lands, on the, on the landscapes. 
and it was it was to warn to warn people about what could happen. And I think that that sort of atmosphere still exists in America. Um, and I think that there are these these interactions that happen at different points that are in fact warnings that are telling us how we should act or rather how we should not act. And that, um, you know, th these messages, you know, they're, they're quite different for if, if you're black. There are plenty of videos. I, I have this friend that I was, um, I, I did a brief stint in law school for a while. And I have this friend uh, named Chris. And uh, he was uh, a, a, a white guy. He is, and uh, I thought he was a real white ring, crazy kind of person, but he is absolutely this, this amazing guy. And he continually sends me these, these videos or access to these videos where you've got these white guys that are standing with rifles in the middle of street saying, I have a right to hold this rifle, stopping traffic and et cetera, and et cetera. And the policemen, after two hours of talking with them, escort them off and then let them go. And I don't think that if, and I, uh, I've got two pellet guns that I've been trying to shoot squirrels with because they, they, I've spent like $2,000 in keeping squirrels out of my house this summer. And one of my friends, Willis, uh, came to the house uh, and, there were like some squirrels going, trying to get in my attic. And I grabbed the pellet gun and I ran outside. And Willis, you know, made it clear to my wife, what was I doing running outside with something that looked like a real gun? And he talked about how dangerous that was. Now I'm on my property, in my house, and it's just a BB gun. And we think about, I can't remember his name, but the African-American kid in Ohio, who had a BB pistol and the policeman pulled up and shot him within three seconds of arriving. So, you know, this whole thing of, of guns, who gets to have guns, who gets to uh, show them, exhibit them, uh, you know, it's that there are all kinds of devices and, and, and things and messages about what you should do and, and, and what you should not do in, in America. Titus, this is Maria from the booth. Uh, we didn't get any questions, but we do have a comment from Linda Roberts. Uh, she said, bravo, deep, beautiful, and powerful. Thank you, Titus. Thank you. Yeah. And we also got another comment from Cordrell Colbert. He says, hi, Titus, uh, Cordrell here from your light factory class. I got this email link, so no technical difficulties on this end this time. Uh, he's in <laughs> awe at your immense bodies of work and thanks you for being an amazing mentor and teacher. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So one of the things I'm doing is I've got, I'm working with a group of young, young black photographers of which uh, Philip is one uh, through the Light Factory in, in, in Charlotte. And we do these classes uh, a couple of times a month and we're doing it for what, like six or seven months. Started in August and it'll go on until January, at least I know, I, I know for sure. So it's, it, it's been great because it's given me opportunities not only to talk about photography, on my terms, but also to go out and work with guys like Phil, who you know, who, who shoot all of this stuff and do it somewhat differently. So it keeps it keeps me young. I like that. <laughs> Titus, I think we have time for one more question. Okay. We've gone over time, and I know we could probably talk all day, but we can take one more question. All right. Okay. Phil, it's on you. It was more of a, um, I guess, more of a statement than anything. It's like, so just, uh, you know, I identify as a straight black man, but at the same time, it is, you know, 
a lot of the issues that we deal with and everything that kind of goes on does affect a lot of other communities and identities that are under the black umbrella. And a lot of the times it does kind of focus on black men, but in reality, like other identities do have a lot worse situations. But I do think that when it comes to police at times, you know, like black men are always viewed as like, you know, more violent and stuff like that. So it's, we do deal with it in different ways, but at the same time it is, you know, these other communities that have to deal with it. And also just personally, you know, from my own experiences and just seeing how thing has, how everything has gone kind of like through the history of just black existence in America and just outside of America as well too. I'm an advocate for, you know, black self-defense in all the forms that it comes in, whether it's with firearms or just anything in general. So I just wanted to kind of say that. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. So today, just really, whenever you photograph anything, um, I think of the first thing I always think of is you have to have you do it with intention. You 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 uh, know what you're trying to achieve, uh, and then you work backwards from there. And if you're lucky and you do some things right, then you can come out with with great images. Uh, but always respect the amount of power that you have and always respect the fact, respect everyone that you, that you photograph. Uh, we all deserve that. You know, our humanity is, is important. And when you have a camera, it's a tremendous piece of power. It really is. It, it, is, it is an absolutely tremendous piece of power. Uh, it has gotten me in places that I knew I never would have walked, been able to walk into uh, empty-handed. And I, with a camera, no one asked me a question as to why I was there, what was my purpose, or what I was. So it's, it's, that's a burden, because what you need to do is, when people afford you that kind of access, that you have an obligation to treat them fairly. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you everyone for coming today and please check the website for all of the additional photography um, workshops and opportunities for click coming the rest of the month. Thank you. <laughs>